Chapter 13 of Jerry McCauley, His Life and Work by Jerry McCauley and edited by Robert M. Offord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kristen Hand. Chapter 13 On the Old Spot. The dead are like the stars by day, withdrawn from mortal eye, yet holding unperceived their way through the unclouded sky. By them, through holy hope and love, we feel in ours serene, connected with a world above, immortal and unseen. The memorial meeting held at 316 Water Street on Sunday afternoon, September 28th, will not be forgotten by those who were present. Not only were tributes of esteem to the memory of Jerry McCauley uttered by those who were co-workers with him or who knew him and his work, but many who had been led by him to Christ testified as to what Grace had done for them through our departed brother. It was eminently appropriate to hold a memorial service on the old spot where he commenced his work, and where for so many years God so richly blessed him to the salvation of souls. The mission hall was packed, and at every window were persons who could not find room inside, but bore the discomforts of standing all the way through, listening with the deepest attention. The exercises commenced precisely at the hour arranged, half past two, and continued for two full hours with unflagging interest. General Clinton B. Fisk presided, and after the congregation had sung the hymn, They Are Gathering Homeward One by One, called on Rev. J. W. Sanford to read from the Bible and pray. The scriptures selected were most appropriate and were impressively read. The prayer was simple and solemn. And then we sang the words, I heard the Savior say, etc. The chorus brought to General Fisk's recollection some of the scenes in the old mission building which preceded the one in which we met on this Sabbath afternoon. Often in the old days, when kneeling with Jerry and his wife and others, some soul was born into the kingdom, Jerry would say, Sing, Jesus paid it all. Reference was made to the memorial meeting of the previous Sabbath at the Broadway Tabernacle. The audience on that occasion, the speaker likened to a slice of metropolitan life cut lengthwise, so that there was some of the top crust, some of the bottom crust, and some of all between. The best of saints and the most sinful of all were there. Men high in financial circles, in social life, and in professional life were the pallbearers in the funeral procession which wended its way from 104 West 32nd Street to the tabernacle. A stranger might have asked, who is this at whose death the city is stirred? Was he a great warrior whose sword saved the Republic? No. Although he was a victor, his victories were those of mercy, not of carnage. He was not a statesman eminent in the forum. He was a simple, unlettered man. On his coffin were the words, died September 18, 1884, Jeremiah Macaulay, aged 45 years. That was the story. He had been one of the worst men, but became one of the best, simply through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Accepting Christ for himself, he had been used of God to preach the gospel by his words and by his walk. General Fisk spoke of his early association with Jerry and the work, and of its extended influence. In Liverpool one night, he heard a rough-looking sailor speak in a seaman's mission meeting. Though the man was rough, his face shone. I found Jesus over there in America, he said, and all who heard him listened in wonder. This man was known as Swearing Johnny. When we were paid off, I took my money to the saloons, and then pretty soon I was drunk again. Then I went out into the street, and the snow was beating against my face. As I passed along the street, I heard singing and stopped to listen. I heard them sing, Jesus loves even me. I'll go in and see about it, I said to myself. He went in, and there he saw that wonderful man, Jerry McCauley, and he led him to Christ. Yes, said his wife, and it has been nothing but Jerry McCauley and Jesus loved even me ever since Johnny's ship came home. At Marseille, General Fisk heard a very similar testimony from another redeemed man, and Mrs. McCauley, he said, had letters from all parts of the globe, letters baptized with many tears, which testified to the work done by this one good man. The speaker concluded with an earnest appeal for renewed consecration. Let us consecrate ourselves anew to the service, he said. Catch the standard ere it falls. In the first regiment I led into the field in the war, the boy who carried the banner almost fell at the first firing. His brother sprang forward and grasped the standard so that our flag never went down. See that the standard that Jerry has dropped be not allowed to fall. 
One of the early and most helpful friends of the deceased missionary was the Honorable William E. Dodge, now in glory. He was often in the mission meeting and knelt with those who sought salvation and prayed and labored with them. The memory of his love of the work made it all the more pleasant to hear from his son, the Reverend E. Stewart Dodge. He likened Jerry to a jewel taken up from the depths, but the speaker would have us glory not in Jerry Macaulay, but in the grace magnified in him. We must remember in speaking of him that he always glorified his master. He told men and women that Jesus could save. Poor lost souls came to him and heard that there was a Savior mighty to save, and so were converted. Jerry honored the gospel as revealed in the Bible. He read the Bible, talked the Bible, preached the Bible. It was God's word, and in it was revealed the power of God to save. Jerry believed in prayer. When he prayed, he did not pray all around the universe. If he was interested in a soul, he just prayed for that particular soul, and God heard and saved. Moreover, Jerry believed in hand-picked souls. The best fruit is not shaken from the tree, but picked by hand, one by one. So he would hold up Christ before one soul. He believed in the power of the Spirit of God. He did not believe that his effort or anybody's else would save. He believed that God's Spirit would bless the truth about the blood so that it would do its own convicting and converting work. What a difference this truth worked in him. Once a dock thief, Jerry Macaulay went up to heaven, his arms all full of sheaves. Let us magnify and honor the gospel of God which makes such a change. Two thoughts the speaker impressed in closing. If there is one here who has not given his heart to the Savior, he said, remember that God saved Jerry Macaulay and he can save you. God lifted Jerry up and you have no right, therefore, to despair or to doubt God's mercy. Christian workers, since God used this instrument for his own mighty purposes, no one can say, God cannot use me. We cannot do Jerry Macaulay's work, but we can do our work as Jerry did his, with consecrated hearts and true faith. Reverend E. D. Murphy was the next speaker. He has been the pastor of the Mariner's Church on Catherine Street for more than 20 years. He said that thinking of what Water Street was 20 years ago, this audience seemed perfectly wonderful. It was at that time one of the worst streets in the city. He recollected the first religious meeting attempted there. He recalled, too, the first time that he ever saw Jerry McCauley. The latter was rather a rough-looking man then. It was in the midst of the John Allen excitement that Jerry came to him and said, I've served the devil very faithfully in the fourth ward. The bloody fourth, it was often called then. And now I want to try to do something for the people there. If some person would rent a building, I would fit it for men who have just come out of state's prison. He would have cots for them to sleep on and bread and coffee to give them in the morning, he said, and have a prayer meeting for them in the evening. Mr. Murphy had no doubt of Jerry's honesty, sincerity, and earnestness, but he must confess that he did doubt the man's ability and judgment. Not liking to discourage him, he recommended him to see Mr. A.S. Hatch and Reverend G.J. Minigans, the city missionary in that ward. The next thing Dr. Murphy heard about it was that a building had been rented and the work was begun. We learn that God's ways are not our ways, said the speaker. Who would ever have thought of selecting Jerry for the work he did? But Jesus died to save sinners, and in his sight a thief's soul is as precious as any. God desired to reach such, and so made choice of one of the least promising, and baptized him and filled him with the Holy Ghost and told him to go to work. Jerry's ready mother wit, the tenderness of his appeals to the unsaved, his prayers so simple, tender, gentle, as though talking with the Lord, and his personal work with souls passed under review. Then Dr. Murphy said that hundreds of sailors had come under his notice in his church work who had been led to Christ by Jerry McCauley. Every single night Jerry had a hold of somebody. Dr. Murphy concluded his remarks by emphasizing the value of personal work with souls. In connection with his house of worship are eight or nine inquiry rooms which have proved the birthplace of many souls. In personal conversation, men cannot pass the truth presented over to their neighbors. They know it is addressed to them individually. At the closing of the address, two of the members of Dr. Murphy's choir sang a duet. We shall sleep, but not forever. There awaits a glorious dawn. We shall meet to part, no never, etc. General Fisk said he had letters from some of the Cremorne Mission trustees expressing regret in their ability to attend the service owing to absence from town. Messrs. J. Noble Stearns, John H. Boswell, Samuel E. Hiscox, and James Talbot were all heard from. 
the latter closed with these words as we hold this service in his memory may our own hearts be filled with a deeper love for christ and our lives receive a fresh impulse to work for souls that the world shall not be poorer because this brave true heart has gone to its reward mr a s hatch another of the trustees and who was used under god as a sheet anchor for jerry mccauley when the latter started on his career as a christian worker followed with an address the chairman said that jerry would often speak to him of mr hatch's good help i could not have struggled on to success the redeemed man would say had it not been for the brotherly sympathy and helpfulness that christ jesus inspired toward me in the heart of mr hatch he trusted me general and that's what saved me mr hatch said that he loved jerry with a love and sorrowed for him with a sorrow which could not be expressed in words and he would not therefore attempt to speak of his own emotions at his death but here on the spot where jerry first bore testimony to the power of the lord jesus to save and where he first commenced his work the speaker thought it peculiarly fitting to draw some lessons from his life he was a remarkable man in many respects almost without worldly education he became by grace and prayer and the study of god's word learned in the wisdom that is from above he had a remarkably vivid apprehension of those portions of scripture which are particularly adapted to the class whom he mainly sought to reach those who had heard him speak of the prodigal son of the thief on the cross of the publican in the temple of the woman taken in adultery or of her who washed the feet of jesus with her tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head would never forget it the sweetness and tenderness which grace had infused into that naturally rough nature were wonderful to see and would ever be remembered by those who had seen them poured out over kneeling and repentant sinners or experienced them in the private relations of personal friendship it was beautiful to see the flowers and fruits of grace blossoming and ripening on the branches which jesus had grafted on that rugged trunk a more earnest faithful conscientious and devoted laborer for the master whom he loved and for the lost men and women over whom his heart yearned never lived than jerry macaulay jerry loved to proclaim the power of jesus to save to the uttermost all who come to god by him it was not two weeks since the speaker was asked if he believed there were any permanent results from this mission work why look at jerry was the reply he has stood well perhaps he'll slip was the inquirer's response when mr hatch told mrs macaulay of this incident a day or two previously she replied yes he has slipped slipped into heaven the speaker said that the truth proclaimed by jerry so constantly in his life namely christ's power to save to the uttermost had been enforced and emphasized by jerry's death his steadfastness to the end and his triumphant death had silenced forever the doubting question that he might yet fall away he could not fall now another lesson learned was that it paid to work for and to spend time and money for the redemption of the outcast and degraded it was worth while to spend time and money on any soul for whom christ had died in concluding mr hatch said that to the unsaved sinner despairing perhaps because so low down in sin that he thinks there is no salvation for him jerry seemed to be saying still look at me jesus saved me there is hope for you to the child of god he said that no labor money or pains spent in proclaiming the gospel to the lost and perishing is spent in vain if jerry's death should enforce these lessons he would not have died in vain the order of the meeting was then changed the appointed speakers had accomplished their tasks and those who owed their conversion to jerry macaulay as god's chosen instrument in connection with his water street work were asked to speak mr j f shorey the superintendent of the water street mission said he was saved in connection with messrs woody and sankey's meetings in new york eight years ago he had not long been intimately acquainted with jerry personally but he had become very familiar with the results of his work as he had heard so many testify how jerry had led them to christ several converts followed and their testimonies were most touching full of expressions of gratitude to god for having brought them under jerry's influence of one of these tributes of gratitude first to god and then to jerry a full report was kept it was the tribute of a young man he said it was eight years ago last february that i came from my home in brooklyn to the water street mission i had never heard testimonies before but then i heard young men saying how happy they had been since jesus saved them i thought that if he saved them he would save me i had a good home and christian parents but i was not happy for i was sinning against god jerry got hold of me and bid me go up to the bench and the friends would pray for me 
Well, I determined to put my trust in God's promises, and that night I started in the new way. Next night I went to the mission again. I had not had a good day. I had not acted as a Christian. So when Jerry asked me, how do you feel today? How have you got along? I told him it had been a pretty poor day with me. Well, don't be discouraged, he replied, and then bid me to go again to the bench and pray. I had a happier day next day. In the evening, Jerry said to me, well, how has it been today? That's when I told him that I had been happier and had felt Christ's keeping power. He responded, get up and tell us about it then. This was eight years ago, and Jesus saves me today. One night I remember that some sailors were at the bench, that dear old bench, where so many found the Savior. We almost reverenced it. One of these sailors longed to trust the Savior, but could not see the way clear. How could he trust so as to be kept safe henceforth? That was the question. Said Jerry, can't you trust the Lord from here to the door? Yes, he thought he could do that. Then can't you trust him from the door to the corner? Was the next question. Light burst into the man's heart and beamed upon his face, and he exclaimed, I see the whole of it. Glory to God. It is just trusting Jesus, simply trusting every day. I have not only Christian parents now, but I have a Christian wife too. I owe my salvation and all the blessing that has come since under God to Jerry McCauley. I put the Lord Jesus first and Jerry McCauley after. When men used to talk of what Jerry had done for them, he would say, Don't give me any glory, boys. Give God the glory. If I have been of any use to you, it is all God working through me. In Jerry's death, I have lost one of my best friends. Could any words have more forcibly shown first Jerry's humility and next his apt way of dealing with souls? He encouraged new converts in the early days of their Christian life, when they felt that they had made any progress and overcome any temptation through Christ, he would have them rise and testify. This testimony helped and strengthened the converts who uttered it, encouraged other converts, and impressed those who were yet in the darkness and bondage of sin. How suggestive to the words, don't give me any glory, boys. To be successful in Christian work, self must be kept down, and Christ must be exalted. In Water Street, at the Cremorne Mission, anywhere, everywhere, God honors those who seek to honor and glorify him. End of chapter 13